So today we'll be discussing about thoracic wall and intercostal spaces. So the thorax is an osteocartilaginous elastic conical cavity. So having an inlet which is narrow and an outlet which is wide. And it is flattened anteroposteriorly. And it is kidney shaped, reniform on cross section. But in newborn it appears rounded on cross section. You can see this is the entire thorax. So anteriorly bounded by the sternum. If we elaborate the parts of the sternum, you can see this is the manubrium, this is the body and this is the xiphoid process. So this will be the manubrium sternal joint which also known as sternal angle. So it is very important. It corresponds with the lower border of T4. So many structural changes will be happening here. Beginning of arch of aorta and termination of arch of aorta. Then uh, <coughs> uh, trachea will be dividing into two principal bronchi. And then even uh, you can also see that uh, uh, there will be deviation of uh, thoracic duct from uh, <coughs> right to left close to this sternal angle. So like this so many structural changes are happening at the level of sternal angle. So we will deal with it when we are seeing the mediastinum. We can clearly see in the dissection all the structural changes. Mm, this will be the junction between the superior mediastinum and inferior mediastinum. <coughs> so then if you see the other bones which are forming the uh, thoracic wall, you can see here uh, there are 12 pairs of ribs on either side. You can also see the costal cartilages and posteriorly if you see there are 12 thoracic vertebrae. So boundaries behind. So these are the boundaries for the entire thoracic wall. So thorax is bounded behind by 12 thoracic vertebrae and intervertebral discs between them. And also by the posterior parts of the ribs up to posterior angle of the ribs. <coughs> in front, it is a sternum. Manubrium lies at the level of T3 and T4. The body of the sternum lies from T5 to T8. Manubrium sternal joint is at T4. It's an important landmark. So, assuming it's after 60 years, it's a secondary cartilaginous joint. Then, Ziffy sternal joint, so it is at the level of intervertebral disc between T8 and T9. Ossifies after 40 years, it is also a secondary cartilaginous joint. On each side, 12 ribs separated by intercostal spaces, which are occupied by intercostal muscles, vessels, and nerves. So, inlet of the thorax, it is kidney shaped. Anteroposterior diameter is 5 cm and transverse diameter is 10 cm. So, behind, it is bounded by body of T1, sides by the first rib. Front, it is bounded by the upper border of the manubrium. So the sternal end of the first rib lies approximately 3 to 4 centimeters below the vertebral end. So inlet slopes downwards and forwards. So outlet, it is wider than the inlet. It is bounded behind by the body of T12 on sides 11th and 12th ribs. So in front, 7, 8, 9, 10 costal cartilages, zephyr process forming an intrasternal angle. And outlet is closed by diaphragm which forms floor of the thorax. So functions of the thorax. So as a cage, it contains and protects organs of respiration and circulation. And a few subdiaphragmatic organs are sheltered beneath the costal margin like liver, spleen, <coughs> upper part of the stomach. Then uh, it also alters the diameter of thorax in respiration and inspiration. Um, like inspiration, it's an active process, whereas expiration is a passive process. So the mostly is written because sometimes expiration is also active when we do forced expiration. You can see here, this is the anterior view of the sternum, this is the manubrium, this is the suprasternal notch, this is the notch for the clavicle and this is the first costal notch, this is the second costal notch. So you can see half is with the manubrium, half is with the body of the sternum and here you can see the third, fourth, fifth and sixth costal notches for the respective costal cartilages and you can see here it is the seventh notch. So seventh notch is again half in the body of the sternum half in the zephyr process. So you can see clearly here. So one full first costal notch. So this is the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh. So here these sternibrae are the segmental development of the sternum. So these sternibrae represent the segments from which the sternum develops. Four sternibrae are helping in the formation of the sternum. You can see this is the uh, typical rib. <coughs> this is the vertebral end which is also called as the head. You can see two 
facets so then this is the neck so this is the tubercle and then you can see this is the shaft so this is a posterior angle and you can see here this is the costal groove which is close to the inferior margin so this will be the internal surface this will be the external surface this is the upper border and this will be the lower border <coughs> These are the atypical ribs. This is the first rib. This is the first rib. And here you can see the second rib. So here you can also see the floating rib. So this will be again a typical rib. So if you see here, total there are 12 ribs. 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 and 10. Okay. 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So these are the even up to 9. 3 to 9. 3 to 9 are the typical trips. 3 to 9 are the typical trips. First, second, 10, 11, 12 are atypical trips. So here you can see this is the first trip which is a atypical rib. This is the second rib, which is again a atypical rib. So this is a floating rib. So 11th and 12th ribs are floating ribs because they won't come anteriorly. They don't join the costal margin. Only up to the 10th rib, 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th costal cartilages will join to form the <coughs> costal margin and they are directly or indirectly attached to the sternum. Whereas 11th and 12th ribs, they will be floating. So if you see here in this diagram, See here, 11th and 12th. So they never come and join with the sternum, either directly or indirectly through the costal cartilages. Whereas if you see other ribs, they are joining with the sternum. <coughs> so that is why 11th and 12th ribs are called as floating ribs. So that is why the intercostal spaces, though there are 11 intercostal spaces, the last two spaces are incomplete anteriorly. So that is why if you see there are 11 posterior intercostal arteries but only 9 anterior intercostal arteries. So we have seen the chest wall was formed by the sternum and ribs and now we will see the thoracic vertebrae. So as I said earlier typical ribs and atypical ribs. So typical ribs were 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 and 9. 1st, 2nd, 10, 11, 12 are atypical ribs. Same way, in the thoracic vertebrae also, if you see, this is a typical thoracic vertebrae. As you can see, any vertebrae will have a body and a vertebral arch. And if you see, classically, the shape of the body is cubes heart shaped. Anterior posterior diameter is almost equal to the transverse diameter. And if you see here, the vertebral canal or the vertebral foramen is rounded because the spinal cord is also small and rounded in this thoracic region. And you can see these are the pedicles, these are the laminae, these are a pair of superior articular process, this is the spinous process, this is the transverse process and here these are the inferior articular process. So this is the inferior vertebral notch and this will be the superior vertebral notch. So these are the demi facets. So how we identify the thoracic vertebrae from other vertebrae is the presence of this costal facets on the body as well as on the transverse process. So this is the characteristic of the thoracic vertebrae. So if costal facets are not present, that means it is some other vertebrae. If costal facets are present either on the body or on the transverse process or on the both, definitely that should be a thoracic vertebrae. So these are the features of the typical thoracic vertebrae. That means there should be two demi facets on the body and there should be one facet, one costal facet on the transverse process. Same way, you can also see the spine is sloping obliquely downwards. And now let us see the typical and atypical thoracic vertebrae. Like I said in the ribs, <coughs> first, second, 10, 11, 12. So five ribs were atypical. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine were typical. Now if you see in the thoracic vertebrae, you can see here T1, T9, T10, T11, T12. So these five are atypical thoracic vertebrae. That means T2 to T8. T2, 
T3, T4, T5, T6, T7, T8. These are typical thoracic vertebrae. So now I'll show you how these uh, thoracic vertebrae are atypical. Like I said, there should be two demi facets, two half facets in the typical thoracic vertebrae. If you see, these are the two demi facets. But if you see T1, there is one complete facet to articulate with the first rib and there is one demi facet for the second rib. One complete facet and one demi facet. So this will, this will differentiate the T1 from other typical thoracic vertebrae and the body of the T1 will also have more features of cervical rather than the thoracic because there will be a gradual change from cervical to thoracic. Then if you see T9, there are no two demi facets. There is a one demi facet. So if you see in T1, there is one complete facet and one demi facet. And here it is only one demi facet. Okay. So this how the T9 becomes atypical. And now if you see T10, there is not, see atypical should have two demi facets. There are no two demi facets. And T9 is having one demi facet. But if you see T10, it is having one complete facet which is closer to the upper border, which is closer to the upper border. Now, if you see T11, again one complete, complete facet, which is somewhat away from the upper border and encroaching, trying to encroach onto the pedicle. And if you see T12, it is more close to the inferior vertebral notch and onto the pedicle. So T10, T11, T12, these three are having single facet on the body, but in relation to the border. That means if you see the single facet close to the upper border or encroaching onto the upper border that will become T10 and slightly away from the upper border and encroaching onto the pedicle it becomes T11 and completely encroached onto the pedicle close to the inferior tibial notch that becomes the T12 and remaining all are that is T2, T3, T4, T5, T6, T7, T8 are typical thoracic vertebrae and if you see in T11 and T12 if you properly observe on the transverse process of the T11 there is no costal facet. There is no costal facet. Vice versa, the 11th rib will not have a tubercle. Same way, if you see the transverse process of the T12, it is not like the typical transverse process of the thoracic vertebrae. It is having three processes. It is having three processes or three tubercles. So, if we completely see the thoracic wall, thoracic wall is made up of one sternum which is having a manubrium, which is having a manubrium body and xiphoid. And there are ribs. The rib is typically having a head or a vertebral end followed by neck, then tubercle, then shaft, which is having two angles. The more prominent one is the posterior angle and then the anterior less prominent angle. So the anterior end is called the sternal end or the costal end, which articulates with the corresponding costal cartilage, except in uh, through the corresponding cartilage, it articulates with the sternum, except in T11 and T12, where they are floating ribs. So now you can see these are the atypical ribs. So this is a typical rib and these three are atypical ribs. If you see there are 12 ribs out of that uh, first rib, second rib, 10th, 11th and 12th. These five are atypical. Three to nine ribs are typical ribs. Same way if you see thoracic vertebrae, there are, there are 12 thoracic vertebrae. T2, T3, T4, T5, T6, T7, T8. These are the typical thoracic vertebrae. Whereas T1, T9, T10, T11, T12 are the atypical thoracic vertebrae. Now, coming to the intercostal spaces, if you see, these are 11 in number. Last two spaces are open in front, 11th and 12th ribs are floating. That is why these two spaces are open in front. I have shown you in the earlier diagram also. See here. See here. These are open. The 11th and 12th ribs are floating ribs. So, the uh, 10th and 11th intercostal spaces are open in front. So spaces between typical ribs and confined to the thoracic wall are typical intercostal spaces. So 3, 4, 5, 6 are the typical intercostal spaces and presents the following boundaries. See, I said spaces between typical ribs. If you see the typical ribs, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 and 9. So 3 to 9 are typical ribs. But still only 3, 4, 5, 6 are typical intercostal spaces because it is not only the space between typical ribs, it is also the area supplied by the typical intercostal nerves. Only 3, 4, 5, 6 
thoracic spinal nerves or typical intercostal nerves because they are only confined to the thoracic pole. I will elaborate on this point when I come to the intercostal nerves. So that is why 3, 4, 5, 6 are the typical intercostal spaces. And these are the following boundaries. Like if we start the boundaries of a typical intercostal space, above it is the sharp lower margin of the upper rib and its cartilage. Below it will be the blunt upper margin of the lower rib and its cartilage. In front, lateral border of the sternum between costal notches. Behind, body of the corresponding thoracic vertebrae. So above it is the sharp lower margin of the upper rib and its cartilage. Below, blunt upper margin of the lower rib and its cartilage. In front, lateral border of the sternum between the costal notches and behind it is the body of the corresponding thoracic vertebrae. So features of typical intercostal space, it is directed downwards and forwards. It is narrow towards the vertebral column and broad towards the sternum. This we can appreciate when we see the intercostal space during the dissection. Remember, it is narrow towards vertebral column and broad towards sternum. The widest at costochondral junction. Widest at costochondral junction. Posterior part of each space is placed between two ribs, interosseous part, and anterior part of each space is placed between cartilages, and it is called intercartilaginous part. Now, contents of the space. So, intercostal muscles. So, three intercostal muscles, namely the intercostalis externus, intercostalis internus, and intercostalis intimus. Then, intercostal vessels, anterior intercostal arteries, and posterior intercostal arteries, and correspondingly, anterior intercostal veins and posterior intercostal veins, and intercostal nerves. Now, if you see here, so this is the intercostal space where you can see this is the posterior intercostal vein, this is the posterior intercostal artery, and this is the intercostal nerve. So, usually they pass between the intercostalis internus and intimus within the costal row. So let us <coughs> go further. So deal with the uh, muscles in the intercostal space. The first one will be the intercostalis external or external intercostal muscle. So its interosseous part is fleshy. That means the part of the intercostalis external which is between the ribs is fleshy. So intercartilaginous part is aponeurotic. That means here the fleshy part is replaced by the anterior intercostal membrane. So externus extends from sternum up to the tubercles of the ribs where it continues with the posterior layer of superior costotransverse ligament posterior layer of superior costotransverse ligament see costotransverse a ligament which connects rib to the transverse process of the thoracic vertebrae that is called as superior costotransverse ligament so intercostalis externus continues with the posterior layer of superior costotransverse ligament origin is from the lower border of the upper rib. Insertion is to the outer lip of the upper border of the lower rib. So, origin is from the upper rib, lower border of the upper rib. Insertion is to the outer lip of the upper border of the lower rib. So, direction in the posterior part it is directed downwards and laterally, and in the anterior part it is directed downwards, forwards, and medially. Whereas, if you see the direction of the intercostalis internus and intimus, it will be exactly opposite to this direction. So now you can see here, so this is the external intercostal muscle, see the direction and see the direction of the internal intercostal and intercostalis intimus muscle. You can see the vessels passing in the costal groove. These are the collateral branches of these vessels and nerves. Now intercostalis internus, in this anterior part is fleshy. If you have seen intercostalis externus, in that anterior intercartilaginous part was membranous. But here anterior part is fleshy. Extends from sternum to posterior angle of the ribs. Here it will be replaced by posterior intercostal membrane. So after this it will be replaced by posterior intercostal membrane which continues with anterior layer of superior costotransverse ligament. So earlier it was the intercostalis externus was continuing with the posterior layer of superior costotransverse ligament. Here it is continuing with the anterior layer of the superior costotransverse ligament. So origin is from costal groove of the upper rib. So in the intercostalis externus, it was from the lower border of the upper rib. Here the origin is from the costal groove of the upper rib. Then insertion, insertion is to the intermediate part of the upper border of the lower rib. So in intercostal externus, insertion was to the outer lip of the upper border of the lower rib. Here the intercostal internus is inserted to the intermediate part of the upper border of the lower rib. So direction is opposite to that of the external muscle. Anteriorly it is downward and laterally, posteriorly it is downwards and medially. So you can see exactly opposite direction of the external intercostal and internal intercostal and innermost intercostal muscle. So intercostal is intimus. 
it is a part of the transverse of thoracic muscle that means more or less it is similar to that other similar parts of the transverse thoracic are subcostalis and sternocostalis so occupies middle two fourth of the typical intercostal space so it is seen only in the middle two fourth of the typical intercostal space intercostal vessels and nerves run between internus and intimus so that is why this is called as the neurovascular plane intimus is absent in upper two spaces so in these two spaces vessels and nerves run in endothoracic fascia between internus muscle and costal pleura so you can see here this is the innermost intercostal muscle so direction is almost similar to the internal intercostal muscle but opposite to external intercostal muscle so origin is from the upper lip of the costal groove the floor of the costal groove it was the intercostalis internus from the lower margin of the rib was the intercostalis externus from the upper lip of the costal groove is the intercostalis intimus so insertion so if we see it is the inner lip of the upper border of the lower lip that means if you take any rib upper border so the upper border is having three lines like outer lip intermediate area and inner lip so outer lip will give insertion to the external intercostal or intercostalis externus intermediate area will give insertion to the intercostalis internus and inner lip will give insertion to the intercostalis intimus so direction is same as internus muscle so nerve supply and action all intercostal muscles are supplied with the corresponding intercostal nerves action external intercostal muscle elevates the ribs and helps in inspiration internal intercostal muscle depresses ribs and helps in expiration so these muscles prevent blowing out and sucking in of the intercostal space during respiration so intercostal arteries anterior intercostal arteries present in all spaces except lower two spaces which are open in front earlier also i have shown in the diagram because 11th and 12th ribs are floating anteriorly these 10th and 11th intercostal space are open so that is why there are no anterior intercostal arteries in these two spaces so anterior intercostal arteries are two in number in each space so one follows lower margin of the upper rib the other follows the upper margin of the lower rib so they pass backward between internus and intimus and anastomose with posterior intercostal arteries at the junction of anterior one third and posterior two thirds of the space so anterior intercostal arteries upper six spaces they arise from anterior uh, internal thoracic artery whereas in lower three spaces they arise from musculophrenic artery so musculophrenic artery is in self a terminal branch of the internal thoracic artery so internal thoracic artery so let us have a brief review of internal thoracic artery so it arises from the first part of the subclavian artery 2 cm above the sternal end of the clavicle so it enters thorax passes downwards and medially behind sternal end of clavicle and first costal cartilage so here it is crossed in front from lateral to medial side by the phrenic nerve so it descends vertically behind the upper six costal cartilages about 1 cm lateral to the sternum then at the sixth intercostal space it ends by dividing into musculophrenic and superior epigastric arteries you can see here this is the subclavian artery you can see the origin of the internal thoracic artery as i said here you can also see the phrenic nerve is crossing uh, the internal thoracic artery from lateral to medial side and it is descending 1 cm away from the lateral border of the sternum so here you can see it is giving rise to the anterior intercostal artery say pair in each space so up to sixth space it is from the internal thoracic artery and below that it will be from the musculophrenic artery you can see the internal thoracic artery terminating into musculophrenic artery and superior epigastric artery superior epigastric artery will enter into the rectus sheath and gets anastomosis with the inferior epigastric artery where the musculophrenic artery will supply the anterior intercostal arteries and end by supplying the diaphragm so relations in front upper six intercostal spaces and their muscles as we have seen in the diagram crossed by the termination of upper six intercostal nerves so behind it rests on the pleura up to second or third costal cartilage below that level it is covered by the transversus thoracis muscle on each side it is accompanied by a chain of parasternal lymph nodes and a pair of vena cava tentis which unite above the third costal cartilage to form a single vein so branches are pericardiophrenic artery so name itself suggests pericardiophrenic that means it supplies both pericardium and diaphragm phrenic means diaphragm so accompanies phrenic nerve supplies pericardium and diaphragm mediastinal branches supplying the mediastinal structures then pericardial directly supplying the pericardium then sternal supplying the sternum anterior intercostal arteries as we have seen in the diagram in the upper six intercostal spaces two in each space then perforating arteries which pierce muscles of the upper five or six intercostal spaces and pectoralis major turn laterally to supply the muscles and skin but in females these are prominent and they supply the enlarged breast so then the terminal branches will be the musculophrenic artery which passes downwards and laterally behind the 7th to 9th costal cartilages and provides anterior intercostal arteries in 7th to 9th intercostal spaces uh, 
Artery pierces the diaphragm deep to ninth costal cartilage, supplies it and unstores with neighboring arteries. So the another terminal branch is the superior epigastric artery, enters rectus sheath through a gap between xiphoid and costal origins of the diaphragm and unstores with the inferior epigastric branch of the external iliac artery. So the clinical importance is in cardiac surgery, sometimes central thoracic artery is anastomosed with a coronary artery distal to the site of obstruction in an attempt to improve the coronary circulation. So then posterior, posterior intercostal arteries. So there is one posterior intercostal artery in each space. In the first and second space, posterior intercostal arteries arise from superior intercostal artery, which is a branch from costal cervical trunk of the subclavian artery. So in the first and second space. Posterior intercostal arteries arise from superior intercostal artery. So this superior intercostal artery is a branch from costal cervical trunk of the subclavian artery. In lower nine spaces, posterior intercostal arteries are branches of descending thoracic aorta. So aortic intercostal arteries of right side are longer than the left side because the descending aorta is on the left side of the vertebral column. As you see here, you can see the first and second intercostal arteries, post intercostal arteries arising from the superior intercostal artery. So this is the first and this is the second post intercostal arteries arising from the superior intercostal artery. So whereas remaining post intercostal arteries are arising from the descending thoracic aorta. So course of post intercostal artery. So before reaching intercostal space, the course is different on two sides. So if you see on the right side, right post intercostal arteries arise from back of the aorta, pass backwards and laterally in front of the vertebral column. Pass backwards and laterally in front of the vertebral column. Pass towards right side behind esophagus, thoracic duct, ajagus vein and sympathetic trunk. They have to cross behind these two important structures, esophagus and thoracic duct and ajagus vein and sympathetic trunk on the right side. So in the posterior part of the intercostal space, artery intervenes between vein above and nerve below. So if we see any uh, neurovascular bundle in the costal groove or the intercostal space, it will be vein, artery and nerve. Vein, artery and nerve. Van. V-A-N. Remember that. In the typical intercostal spaces. But this relation changes in the first intercostal space where it becomes reverse. Nerve, artery and vein. So in typical spaces, it will be vein above, then artery and nerve below, van. So left posterior intercostal artery, it passes backward and laterally by the side of the vertebrae. Whereas in case of right side, it has to pass backwards and laterally in front of the vertebral column. But here, as already the descending aorta is on the left side, it will just pass backward and laterally by the side of the vertebrae. And it passes behind hemiagus vein and sympathetic trunk. So here, the right were crossing behind the esophagus and thoracic duct in addition. So subsequent course of the arteries is similar on both sides. So each artery passes upward and laterally towards angle of upper rib between costal pleura and post intercostal membrane. Each artery passes upward and laterally towards angle of the upper rib between costal pleura and posterior intercostal membrane. So here you have to remember this posterior intercostal membrane is nothing but the continuation of the intercostalis internus muscle. So then it runs forward in costal groove between internus and intimus muscle. Finally, anastomosis with the upper anterior intercostal artery of the corresponding intercostal space. So here artery is accompanied with vein above and nerve below. So always the structures from above downwards is vein, artery and nerve in typical spaces. Exception is in the first space where it becomes nerve, uh, nerve artery and vein. So course of the posterior intercostal artery. So near the angle of the rib, the artery gives a collateral branch which runs forward in the same intermuscular space but close to the upper margin of the lower rib. So collateral branch anastomosis with the lower anterior intercostal artery. So I, I will show you in this diagram. Earlier I have shown you when we are discussing the muscles. See these are the main vessels and these are the collateral branches. So main vessels are running along the upper rib, whereas collateral vessels are running along the lower rib of the intercostal space. So collateral branch anastomosis with the lower anterior intercostal artery. So intercostal veins again same anterior and posterior intercostal veins. Anterior intercostal veins, anterior veins of the upper six spaces drain into internal thoracic vein and those of the succeeding six spaces drain into musculophrenic vein. 
so posterior intercostal vein each space has one posterior vein posterior intercostal vein it passes backwards between internus and intimus as this is the neurovascular plane so then passes between costal pleura and posterior intercostal membrane then passes behind sympathetic trunk receives tributaries from vertebral venous plexus and muscles of back then terminates in different ways in both sides so as we see on the right side the first posterior intercostal vein after passing in front of the neck of the first rib arches forwards above apex of the right lung and suprapleural membrane then drains into right brachiocephalic vein ultimately remember first posterior intercostal vein is draining into right brachiocephalic vein on the right side then second third and occasionally fourth posterior intercostal veins unite to form right superior intercostal vein which drains into arch of ajagas vein and fifth to 11th posterior intercostal veins open independently into vertical part of the ajagas vein so this is on the right side so 1 2 3 4 and 5 to 11 the first one drains into brachiocephalic 2 3 4 join to form right superior intercostal which drains into arch of ajagas vein 5 to 11 directly drain into the ajagas vein whereas if you go on the see you can see this is the ajagas vein you can see here the 2 3 4 joining to form the superior intercostal vein which is draining into arch of ajagas vein and 5th to 11 draining directly into the ajagas vein but if you see on the left side you can see here so this is the accessory hemiajagas vein otherwise called as superior ajagas superior hemiajagas vein and here this is called the hemiajagas vein otherwise called as inferior hemiajagas vein so <coughs> here you can see this side 5 to 11 5 to 11 are directly draining into the ajagas vein but here 5 6 7 8 will drain into the accessory hemiajagas vein and 9 10 11 11 will drain into the hemiajagas vein and ultimately these hemiajagas vein will drain into the ajagas vein only through this this ajagas vein will drain into superior vena cava then the blood goes into the right atrium so this is the difference on the right and left side now let us see in detail about the left side the first posterior intercostal vein drains into left brachiocephalic vein it is more or less similar to the right side then 2 3 4 posterior intercostal veins unite to form the left superior intercostal vein again almost similar to the right side but which passes forward along anterior and to the left of the arch of aorta uh, it is superficial to left vagus and deep to left phrenic and terminates in left brachiocephalic vein whereas on the right side the left uh, the right superior intercostal vein was terminating into the arch of ajagas vein but here the left superior intercostal vein is also terminating into the left brachiocephalic vein then 5 to 7 posterior intercostal vein sometimes eighth also will drain independently into superior hemiajagas vein which was also called as accessory hemiajagas vein then uh, <coughs> these terminate into ajagas vein opposite t7 whereas 8 to 11 or 9 to 11 posterior intercostal veins drain separately into inferior hemiajagas vein or hemiajagas vein proper which terminates into ajagas vein opposite t8 so intercostal nerves 11 pairs each nerve is a ventral ramus of thoracic spinal nerve that means t1 to t11 so <coughs> so i am telling there are 12 thoracic vertebrae but intercostal nerves if they ask you have to tell only 11 pairs why because the 12th t12 is called as subcostal nerve t12 is called as subcostal nerve so how many thoracic spinal nerves 12th pairs of thoracic spinal nerves but how many intercostal nerves 11 pairs of intercostal nerves because the 12th one is called as subcostal nerve third to sixth intercostal nerves are atypical sorry it is not atypical they are typical third to sixth intercostal nerves are typical they are confined only to the thoracic wall remaining all are atypical because see this is a type a typographical mistake so third to sixth intercostal nerves are typical because they are confined only to the thoracic wall the remaining all are atypical because the ventral portion of the t1 it joins with the c8 to form the uh, lower trunk of brachial plexus whereas t2 will continue this lateral cutaneous branch will continue as intercostal brachial nerve which supplies medial side of the upper arm and armpit and if you see 7 to 11 they are actually going to the abdomen so these only four nerves 3 4 5 6 intercostal nerves are confined only to the thoracic wall so they are called as the typical intercostal nerve that's why the spaces present between typical ribs and also supplied by the typical intercostal nerves are the typical intercostal spaces you can see here this is the intercostal nerve you can see it is giving rise to a collateral branch and also a lateral cutaneous branch 
and if we trace this trunk it is going anteriorly piercing all the muscles and becoming anterior cutaneous nerve here this is the lateral cutaneous nerve dividing into anterior and posterior branches the posterior branch is going and joining with the cutaneous branch of the dorsal ramus so this is the intercostal nerve you can also see this is the sympathetic ganglion it is connected by two rami white rami communicantis and gray rami communicantis so this is the dorsal root and this is the ventral root this is the dorsal root ganglia both joining to form the spinal nerve the spinal nerve is dividing into the ventral ramus and the dorsal ramus ventral ramus is connected to sympathetic ganglion by two rami communicantis gray and white rami communicantis white rami communicantis will have the preganglion sympathetic fibers whereas gray rami will have the postganglion sympathetic fibers then you can see the ventral ramus is going forward giving a collateral branch and a lateral cutaneous branch lateral cutaneous branch becomes cutaneous in the metaxillary line then it divides into anterior and posterior the anterior branch will uh, join with the anterior cutaneous nerve which is itself the continuation of the main intercostal nerve and the posterior branch of the lateral cutaneous nerve will join with the cutaneous branch of the dorsal ramus of the corresponding uh, thoracic spinal nerve so passes through corresponding intervertebral foramen enters posterior part of intercostal space medial to superior costal transverse ligament passes upward and laterally behind sympathetic trunk lies in endothoracic fascia between costal pleura and posterior intercostal membrane on reaching angle of the upper rib gives rise to a collateral branch and lateral cutaneous branch the trunk of the nerve passes forward in costal groove between internus and intimus muscles so structures in costal groove from over downwards as i said earlier it is vein artery and nerve only in the first space this relation will change it becomes nerve artery and vein so in the anterior part of the space the nerve passes in front of the sternocostalis muscle crosses central thoracic artery pierces intercostal internus uh, then um, anterior intercostal membrane which is nothing but the continuation of the intercostal externus pectoral is major and terminates as the anterior cutaneous nerve as i have explained in the diagram so communicating branches ganglionic branches as i have shown in the diagram each intercostal nerve connected to sympathetic ganglion by gray and white rami communicantis so white rami is the preganglion sympathetic fibers and gray rami is the postganglion sympathetic fibers so in the anterior part of the space the nerve communicates with the adjacent intercostal nerves behind costal cartilages then distributing branches like a collateral branch it arises from the nerve near the angle of the rib passes forward in the same intermuscular space where main nerve trunk is present so in the anterior part of the space the collateral branch may or may not unite with the <coughs> main nerve trunk if it fails to unite with the main trunk then it ends as an additional anterior cutaneous nerve lateral cutaneous branch arises near angle of rib pierces internus and external muscle in metaxillary line being cutaneous divides into anterior posterior branches anterior unites with the anterior cutaneous nerve i have explained this in the diagram posterior unites with the cutaneous branch of the posterior primary ramus of the same thoracic nerve peculiarities of the first intercostal nerve so ventral ramus of the first intercostal nerve is not entirely intercostal it divides into a large upper branch which joins with c8 to form lower trunk of brachial plexus i have already explained c8 t1 will form the lower trunk of brachial plexus the lower cylinder branch continues as the first intercostal nerve so it passes between internus and costal pleura there is no intimus muscle here nerve runs on under surface of the first rib which is devoid of costal groove no collateral and lateral cutaneous branches relation of the structures is reversed here it is nerve artery and vein so classical relation in costal groove is vein artery and nerve from above downwards but here it is reversed it is nerve artery and vein supplied so anatomy intercostal neuralgia so it is the sharp burning pain along cutaneous distribution of the thoracic spinal nerve causes will be rib fractures then herpes zoster so this herpes zoster will be identified by vascular eruptions along dermatomes of the affected nerves